Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, a podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger and Rachel Wojtek. And our next ancient empire of note is Babylon, which is a very cool empire, just for being cool and also for being extremely important to the biblical narrative. So maybe we should start with the origins of Babylon. We kind of touched on this last week with Assyria, um, but let's let's do a quick refresher on on the origins of the Babylonian Empire. Something I don't think the average Bible reader gets, because I know I didn't for a long time, was that the word Babylon is simply the Greek form of the word Babel. They're not two different places or things. It's the same thing spoken of by two different people. So to talk about the origins of Babylon is to talk about the Tower of Babel, or Babel if you prefer. I go back and forth. Uh, in the wake of the flood, uh, people decided that they did not like the promises and the commands that God had given them through Noah, and they were fearful. They decided that they would build a community, a city, and at its heart, a tower whose top was into heaven. That is a temple, a religious device that would allow them to bring themselves into the very presence and essence of divinity. God was unimpressed, and God scattered the builders and altered their languages, and we know the story. In the wake of that, Nimrod, who the other the non-biblical histories tell us was intimately involved there, apparently stayed and collected whomever he could and made it the beginning of his empire, and then he went out and, and collected and built other cities. We saw that one of them was Nineveh. So th this is the beginning of this thing. And God called it was God who called it Babel, which the Bible says means confusion. The Greeks and other pagans said, Babel, the gate of the gods. <laughs> that sounds so much more appealing. <laughs> yes, doesn't it? <laughs> A lot more. Uh, so this was the, the, the first a seemingly democratic attempt at world government. Uh, as you read the text, it's all about let us do this and let us do that and let us all do this. Although which if does, it was so democratic, it's amazing that Nimrod got <laughs> to be, you know, the guy after it was all yeah, over. <laughs> exactly. Just because uh, a movement has a, a front, a facade of popular government uh, means nothing. I mean, anybody who understands politics is sure to know that the first step toward tyranny is someone playing the role of a demigod and saying, we're all in this together. This is all us. This is the people. Power to the people. And slogans like that that echo through the last couple hundred years of history. Power to the people. It's me. I'm the people. <laughs> yeah. I'm the people. And so uh, this stands at the beginning of the second age of mankind, uh, this this new world, this new beginning after the flood, and, and and the ideas there that man can, by his own efforts, technology, magics, um, philosophies, religion, something can bridge the gap between humanity and divinity. If there is a gap, maybe it's just that we don't perceive the reality. Uh, it's a rejection of the biblical doctrine of the discontinuity of being or the creator-creation distinction, the belief that man and God are ultimately of the same essence, and we just need to cultivate that. And oddly enough, cultivating it for the masses generally means one person, as you say, one person gets to be the unity and pull everything together. Uh, that's the origins. And and from here, we can trace the history of Babylon in and out, up and down for a long time. And we generally don't, not even secular historians do, because it's not terribly interesting. Uh, there's, a, there's a Babylonian kingdom, we, we think of the name Hammurabi and his mm -hmm. code of laws. Uh, he's often thought of as the first lawgiver, but <laughs> a reconstruction of chronology along biblical lines would put Hammurabi actually in the days of Joshua or later. So, no, the Bible didn't get its law code from the Babylonians. The Babylonians stole it like they stole so many things from other people, in this case, from God's people. 
Uh, and it just kind of percolates there in the background. Assyria becomes more important. Babylon is a little city within the Assyrian Empire. It has a king named Merodach Baladin who keeps revolting and keeps getting smushed, slapped down, knocked out of the park um, by the Assyrians. And, and it, finally, the Assyrians actually destroyed Babylon. Uh, and shortly, it would be about the time of Hezekiah, a little bit after. And then they foolishly rebuilt it <laughs> in the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria. And it becomes a real threat. So that the time that the Assyrian Empire is winding down, we begin to see Babylon cutting deals with other peoples. We we run into well some names that people will probably you know history at all. You or if you read your Bible a lot, you might recognize some of these. Nabopolassar. Well, and all the Babylonian kings were named after their gods. You can figure out who's who and what's what. Nabopolassar was a great Babylonian general, and he cut deals with the Medes and the Scythians and other peoples, and they all decided to get together and attack Nineveh all at once. And Assyria was in such a state of moral decay that it crumpled, collapsed, the royal family, the army fled to a city on, um, the, Euphra on the Euphrates called um, Carchemish, uh, which we run into in the books of Kings and Chronicles. And they, Assyria makes its last stand there. And this is where the biblical story of Pharaoh Necho dashing up through Palestine to lend aid to his uh, suzerain, the king of Assyria, comes in. And where Josiah dies in Megiddo, trying to interfere when he shouldn't have. And the king of Egypt, Pharaoh Necho, having got there and having lost, turns back around and runs like a bunny all the way back to Egypt. And, and we get this interesting game of freeze tag. As Necho was, is coming back, he stops briefly at every major city and says, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine, <laughs> and keeps on running. And in his wake is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son, young man named Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar II, actually. Uh, he is a great general. But in the end, he values himself not so much as a military leader and conqueror, but as an architect and builder. That we'll, we'll come back to that later. But he's chasing Pharaoh Necho all the way back through Palestine and unfreezing anybody he's frozen and taking them for Babylonian territory, which is why when you're going through the last chapters of Second Kings, we, we get this really quick change in kings. The king of Egypt gets rid of the former king, makes his own guy king. He leaves. Nebuchadnezzar comes along, gets rid of that king, puts his own guy on the throne until his own guy turns on him, and then he puts someone else on the throne. Um, and Nebuchadnezzar pursues on into, on into Egypt when he hears that his father Nebuchadnezzar has died. It is the way of empires that when your emperor dies, it's a free-for-all. Because strangely enough, in emperor, in empires based on conquest, no one respects constitutional succession of office. <laughs> Funny that. Uh, and so he knew, and it's a pattern we'll see re repeated in the Persian Empire, he had to get it back home real fast. And so he dashed back home, secured his position, shook hands with all the gods, made it clear that he's in charge, and meanwhile had to deal with Neb with the Jerusalem. That was not being nice. And, and I'll, I'll I'll leave the story there for those of you who want to read it in um, 2 Kings 24, 25, and so on. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar defeats uh, Pharaoh Necho at Carchemish. I'm reading here from my own syllabus. And thus gained a free hand to subdue all of Palestine. Uh, twice Jerusalem rebelled against him. Twice he came against it and carried captive many of its inhabitants, much of their wealth. Which is why you're reading, you often speak of the captivity. Mm. And if we don't know the Bible very well, we get the idea, well, Nebuchadnezzar just came, destroyed the city, and took everyone away. That's not at all what happened. He subdued the, the, the city made a tributary to him, put his guy on the throne, his guy being one of Josiah's heirs, um, and then went about his own stuff. Um, and when he went back home briefly, he did take, uh, well, somewhere in there, the first his first guy, Jehoiakim, 
was uh, not really getting this picture. So he gets taken back and is there for Nebuchadnezzar's coronation. And somewhere in there, Nebuchadnezzar grabs the best and the brightest and brings them to Babylon. And I think, uh, I think we've kind of implicitly agreed that we want to talk about Daniel a good, a good deal tonight because this is this is where the Bible spends most of its time, as far as Babylon's concerned, in Babylon, mm-hmm. uh, with God's prophets. Now Jeremiah had been prophesying when Jerusalem fell, and the tale in both of Kings and of Jeremiah tell us what happened with him. That's more the end of the history of, of Israel, because he doesn't go to Babylon. Ezekiel does, and so his story is related to Daniel's. He's prophesying about the same time Daniel is, but he's out amongst the common people, amongst God's people. He doesn't see the palace or the throne, or for, for him, it's about a people in captivity, not about the empire that captured them. Um, and, and so we, we run into these young folk, um, Daniel, and at this point, you turn and ask everybody in the room, and what were the names of his friends? And in most cases, you're going to hear... Shadrach, Shadrach, and Benny, Shadrach, and Benny, 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 Although, let me put in a good word for VeggieTales on the uh, on the fiery furnace. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the the VeggieTales versions are very trivializing and uh, and don't uh, show the the um, the weightiness of of sin. Mm. Um, they sort of substitute sin with something else. Yeah. Um, but in in Rack Shack and Benny, um, the crime for which the vegetables are thrown into the fiery furnace is actually stand bowing to a giant chocolate bunny, which <laughs> is about as ridiculous as idolatry is. <laughs> and it's actually idolatry. So there you go. You know, there are a lot of us who would prefer chocolate to gold mm-hmm. and, you know, bunny over golden calf or a obscure statue or obelisk, whatever the thing was. So, you know, it does, yeah, it's a good point. It does not matter what you bow to if the thing isn't the God of the Bible. So it is still idolatry, it is still sin. And Nebuchadnezzar is operating in terms of idolatry, but the idolatry is that of ancient Babel. The power, the hope, the virtue of the state of humanity ultimately is vested in the priest king himself. And to betray the king, to war against him, to resist him, is not merely to resist a would-be conqueror, it's to resist the future, the hope of mankind, the new world order, our destiny. <laughs> and so he's he's not pleased with this, and we're going to see that when he gets word from Daniel about his first dream. He is only confirmed to that. Oh, God says I'm the head of gold. Well, things get worse after me, but right now for the moment, I'm God's man. How good can this be? Let's build a statue and worship it. But first, Daniel and his friends. Yes, their names are not, were not originally Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah. Names that reflected uh, the God of the Bible, Jehovah. Why'd they get their names changed? Bab- Remember that Assyria was very violent in its approach to creating this new world order. They tried to eliminate all differences and fuse everything into some kind of stew pot of we're all Assyrians and that's all the only claim to unity we have. The Babylonians were more subtle and careful and perhaps more... Um, politic and what they did. Their idea was, we're going to conquer these nations, but then we're going to take the best and brightest of their of their young men, and we're going to bring them to Babylon, and we're going to give them a free education in Babylon University. We're going to look after them and give them the best clothes, the best food, the best lifestyle, the best women, high connections. All, we're not going to violate their consciences or force them to do anything. I mean... You can have all this stuff, or you can sit there and have bread and water for all we care. But if you pass the, your classes, if you get with the program, if you're willing to come on board, 
sign the contract, one day you're going to be a great ruler within, within Babylon, and you may even go back to your own people and be our agents there. And how cool is that? You'll be there working for us, but taking care of your people so you can make sure that they get a fair shake and that they're always heard. Isn't that great? Isn't this a wonderful deal? Just let mm -hmm. us educate you for a few years. And we see this so many times in history that it's actually a culture obsessed with luxury and not mm. um, domineering power that often falls apart um, because they're too distracted by their by all their perks and their nice things, and um, it makes it a lot easier to get them to accept you if it seems like they're giving you nice things even if they're taking away what you had before. Um, but then many cultures, as that becomes the obsession of the culture, it destroys the culture. I'm, I'm thinking also of um, Aldous Huxley's warning in Brave New World, where when we become obsessed and we're focused on all the nice things, we miss the reality of what's really going on um, because mm -hmm. it's easier to get people when it's all sugar-coated like that mm -hmm. rather than the domineering that says you will now do this. Um, um, there's a movie whose name I forget. Oh, I think it's simply called Skulls or Bones or something like oh, that. Skulls, yeah. Skull. Mm -hmm. Um, that that plays out this story in the context of an imagine imaginized, um, mm -hmm. fictionalized version of an old Yale secret society fraternity. A uh, young man is um, picked up by the secret society. Um, he doesn't really fit in with it, with the crowd, but they offer him everything. They, they see some use that they have for him and they do what I've just described. They give him the best car, the, a, a letter that will get him into any, um, for your, uh, PhD program, anywhere, a law school, whatever he was after just one thing after another, because this, this society is, made up of former graduates who are all very wealthy because the society made sure they're wealthy. And so it, it becomes very much this thing. And we see played out this kind of decision. You can have it all. Just remember you owe us. And the young man has to decide what to do with that and how that's going to affect his life and his romance with his girlfriend and a whole bunch of other things. It's not in the movie is not far removed from reality. This is not only a tool that's been used in the distant past, it's still the kind of thing that uh, fraternities, secret societies and such do use to snag people. It's not too far from some of the descriptions the Illuminati used back in the um, 1700s, 1800s, or however long they may have existed, depending on <laughs> who you believe. It, it, it is a way to pull people in, get them connected, get them get them involved until they're so far in they can't see a way out. Mm -hmm. And then you justify it. But you're helping people. This will be good. You will help your people, your family, your ethnic group, your nation. Just, to, yeah, well, you, you know, omelets and eggs and all that. But in the long run, you will do a lot more good. And certainly you'll do a lot more good for yourself because the alternatives stink. And this was, this is the program that Daniel and his friends were up against. Some of it, they accepted. They, there's no record that they objected to using the new names that were forced upon them, that they insisted in dressing like Hebrews or any such thing. Uh, obviously, at some point, they learned Chaldean. They learned the language of Babylon. There was simply one point where they drew a line and said, all right, here, here's the line. And it was not an obvious line. It was not a clear line. It was not a scripturally explicit line. It had to do with food. And a lot of uh, Bible teaching commentaries have said, well, it, it, it apparently had to do with the Jewish food laws. And yet, the king of Babylon had cows and deers and goats and chickens and all kinds. So it's not an issue of clean or unclean. Mm -hmm. Veggies are not unclean. Fruit's not unclean. What was offered to idols? Well, Paul tells us that that in itself does not matter as long as you don't involve yourself in the idol worship, and these young men obviously didn't. Mm -hmm. And that Besides, was not given as a, a restriction in the Old Testament because it was no. contextually <laughs> not yeah. super relevant at that point. <laughs> yeah. The only thing the text actually says is that it was the king's food. Mm -hmm. 
they did not want to eat the king's food. In our culture, that that seems just kind of bizarre. Why not? What's the big deal? Uh, there was, uh, again, a movie, a novel, I forget. I believe it was called, um, what was it? Lunch with Mussolini or Dinner with Hitler? I forget. But think of it in those terms. How about Dinner with the Antichrist? <laughs> Christians, I think, would probably, oh, no, I wouldn't do that. Well, why not? The Bible doesn't say you can't. Besides, you could tell them about Jesus. Oh, no. Well, yeah, ooh, ooh, no, no kidding. Is it and Tea with Mussolini? Tea with Mussolini. That was it. Yeah, okay. that was it. Thank you. I never saw it, so no memory beyond having known it existed someplace. Uh, they refuse. Actually, they ask if they can refuse. They go through channels. They don't throw a food strike. They don't have a hissy fit, but they go to the guy over them and ask, can we do this? And he's reluctant because you're, you're asking to eat a bunch of ground up seed and have water when we have all this wonderful food and you're not, it's not healthy. So now if, if the issue had been something else, they could have said, could you some go with some food that didn't go before uh, Bell and Marduk, before your idols? That would have been a different conversation, and it might have flown or it might not have, but they don't even do it. They just say, we don't want any food that we're not in charge of. We don't want any food that comes from the king. Our communion is, uh, the meal is communion, mm -hmm. and the king is a religious figure. And so they say, give us this. He cuts them a deal, and at the end of the set time, they are healthier and fatter, fatter and fleshier than all the other people. And you can think about how the other young Jewish men would have reacted to all of this. Daniel, what are you doing? First of all, you missed a great meal. You know, there were 12 kinds of steak and all this. The wines were incredible. You've never tasted anything. Besides, what? how are you ever going to have any influence here if you keep playing the monk over in some corner. You, this, this asceticism is unworthy of someone with a biblical view of dominion and conquest. You got to get in the game. You got to be pitching. Or you're going to be left behind. And, and, and the Bible doesn't even talk about this. You're, you're, you're being really legalistic here. Come on. Let's, let's get with the program. Let's make a difference for Yahweh. The interesting thing is that all those young men, we don't know a thing about them. Their names have perished. And whatever influence they had is forgotten. Daniel and his friends stood before kings and made a difference culturally and spiritually. And Daniel got to write a major book of the Bible and foretell in some detail the coming of Messiah. So what Daniel did was right and God blessed it, but it doesn't mean it was necessarily fun or that it was at all easy. And that's, that's how things stood. He, when he and his friends stood before the king, we're told the king found their wisdom 10 times better than that of all the wise men of Babylon. And it's not hard to see. They believed in a cause and effect uni universe in which God's providence kept things moving in an orderly fashion, as opposed to the chaotic magic of the Babylonian system. The Babylonians could do something like, okay, the reason, Your Majesty, that there is no rain is that the great pig of heaven has eaten half of the moon and has spit it out and it has fallen and disturbed the cycle of the water goddess. Daniel's friends are saying, <laughs> um, there hasn't been any rain in the mountains. Why don't we start building a system of reservoirs and canals to preserve the water and channel it to them? Yeah, we're going with what they said. What are you, pig? What are you talking about? Um <laughs> Also, the moon gets eaten every single month. <laughs> Why this month is there no rain? <laughs> One other possibility that we could see in looking at the other young men of Babylon is there could be the opposite attitude, not of we're going to make a difference for Yahweh, but Yahweh has abandoned us. Oh, we're yes. here because we're being judged and there's nothing left for us but to become Babylonians. That God sent us here. That's who we are now forget about our past. We're never going home. Um, why are you even trying to hold on to these things? And I think uh, one of the points we make is the whole thing with them eating the pulse and being healthy is not because that's actually a fabulous diet, but because no, God does a miracle to confirm that he is still yeah. with them. Yeah. Um, and therefore it gives Daniel and his friends the confidence to use those uh, biblically based uh, wisdom and 
arguments and things because they know that God is still the God here. Um, and we can link that into some of uh, Ezekiel's prophecies where he actually sees the presence of the Lord leaving Jerusalem, but it's coming east to Babylon. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I could see it going both ways of people being like, oh yeah, we're going to do something here or there's nothing left for us. We're just, we might as well get some good food out of it and just mm-hmm. get get a good job or something. And within that, I can see two possibilities as well. One is uh, God has judged us, and we're just going to sit here and sulk about it and do the best we can with what we got. The other is, obviously, the gods of Babylon are superior to what who we thought Yahweh was. Mm-hmm. Apparently, Yahweh is just a phantom, a myth, uh, or he would have spared Jerusalem. He, would have, he can't save his own house. He couldn't protect us. He doesn't exist. So let's eat and drink and be merry and grab what we can. Um, go for the gusto. You only go, one around, one, go around once in life. Something along those lines. And there are probably some other justifications because people play all kinds of mind games when they don't want to obey God. Hmm. And Daniel and his friends stood by faith because, you know, it was not obvious. But the only thing that was obvious in this is that Isaiah many decades before, had said this was going to happen. So there, there's that. Well, God said this was going to happen, and it's happened. So maybe that means God is in control, and that his word is accurate, and that we're getting what we deserve, but that God has a plan that stretches through this, through Babylon and back again. If we're willing to trust him, we can be part of it. It, 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 in, in the light of the of the death and resurrection of Jesus and his his reign from heaven, it is sometimes a lot easier for us to at least theologically see where we're standing. Jesus has come; he's already won. He rose from the dead. He beat death. He beat sin. Where he's on the throne, for them, it was harder. He hadn't come. It'd been a long, long time. Where are the where is the God of Elijah, the God of Moses? Where are the promises? Where are the prophets? The vision fails. Um, it would have been a hard time. And so, and these young men were probably um by the time they graduated, they're probably around 20, because that was about the age of majority in most cultures in that time, as 21 is for us. So they were still very young when they were promoted in the affairs of Babylon. When we come to chapter 2 of Daniel, this this chapter is important for lots of reasons, but one is that it outlines the future of the world to the coming of Christ. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He knows it's weird and special, calls the wise men of Babylon, says, I need you to interpret my dream. They say, that's what we do. Tell us the dream. He says, no, I don't remember it. The thing is gone from me. I know. You tell me the dream and the interpretation, and and then I'll know that you really know what you're talking about. Uh, we It doesn't work that way, boss. I yeah, love this see. move from Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> it's well, such so, a power move. <laughs> yeah, I found out something interesting um, from my husband, David. I guess there was a lot of myths at that time about the kind of devolution progression of empires and mm-hmm. that sense of going from greater to lesser. Yeah. And so some theories are if he had told it, they would have just given him the standard canned answer and he right. knew that it meant something more. So he mm-hmm. figured if I tell it to you, you're just going to tell me what I can already guess. Yeah. So you have to tell me both of them so I can really know what's going on. Um, because some of those those stories could um, were common in their, some of their myths at the time. Mm-hmm. So. Either way, Which he makes pulls sense even today. Like people are still into dream interpretation, <laughs> and uh, it's still a, a a pile of canned answers. <laughs> yeah, it, where you just is. go for the oh, well, this must be the that's yeah. what it always is. So yeah. we'll, we'll go yeah. for for the standard. And he's going, no, this is not normal. Something is going on. I, I need a real interpretation. <laughs> And so he insists that they tell him, and they say, "Can't we don't do that. This, you, this is how it works. You tell us the dream, we tell you the answer. No, no. You're all a bunch of liars. You, you've got something, you've got, as you say, a canned answer. So um, why do I need you? Why are you on the payroll? Why are you in my kingdom? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to kill you all. That, that'll, we just, you know, cut start out over. some. <laughs> start over. Cut out some of the cost here. Eliminate some expenditures. And word goes out that all the wise men all the king's counselors and advisors to be killed. When it comes to Daniel, who was not included in this conference, 
And uh, when he and his friends find out about this, Daniel goes to the king and says, uh, we were not consulted. Give us some time. Let us speak to our God. And we will come up with an answer for you. Now, this was very bold of Daniel, but it's, I'm glad you mentioned earlier that they had seen a miracle. God had done something incredible for them. And, and they had not had a vision or a prophet or anything tell them, stop eating this food, eat this food, and, that, that, and that'll be the thing that'll make everything work. They just did what they thought God wanted them to do and were faithful. And God had done a miracle. And miracles at this point are becoming fewer and fewer. In fact, the last mm -hmm. miracles of the Old Testament pretty much are those that are wrapped up in Daniel, the ones that we all know about, the fiery furnace, the lion's den, and, the, and this food miracle. And even uh, many of the ones that we know from Elijah and Elisha are very small scale. It's not like public news. <laughs> yeah, the last big one, I suppose, was wiping out the Assyrian army but <laughs> yeah. and moving the, moving the sun. Those were kind of big, but that, Daniel's not got that. But now here he is, a captive in a strange land, and the king has a dream, and here he is with some experience in this and, and with the favor of God already tipped in his direction. He knows Ooh. the Bible. This has got to sound really familiar. Could it it's, be Joseph? <laughs> yeah. Joseph did something like this. Is that what, is that what God's after? Well, I can't presume, but... I see a door with the word opportunity written over it. Um, it may they misspelled be... my name tag. It yeah. says Joseph for some reason. I don't yeah. know what that's about. <laughs> so they pray and God reveals the dream and Daniel goes back in and says, all right, King, here's, here's the dream. I won't read the text. Uh, it's repeated twice. Uh, but what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his vision, his dream, was a humanoid statue, large, uh, made of four different metals, a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of, of brass, and the legs of iron. And toward the feet, they're ceramic tacked on with miry clay. Um, intimidating, impressive, um, scary even, not clear what's going on here. But then as Nebuchadnezzar watches, he sees a stone cut out of a mountainside, cut out without hands. This would mean something to Daniel because stones that had not been touched by human uh, hands could be used as altar stones. That stone comes and smashes the image on its feet, um, grinds it to powder. Uh, the wind carries what's left away, and then the stone grows and becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth. And Nebuchadnezzar, no doubt, is impressed that that was it. That's the dream. How did you? Oh, the spirit of the gods is in you. So he's listening. And Daniel says, This, in so many words, this is the future of the world. You're the head of gold. That's, that's your, this is Babylon and specifically it's you. But after you, there will come another kingdom inferior to your kingdom. And after that, a kingdom still more inferior. And after that, yet another kingdom, iron. Iron is not a valuable metal. Nobody trades just to get iron unless you want to make oh swords and tools and things that smash other things. Um, and in the days of these kingdoms, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Uh, it will fill the world uh, and replace every place all the kingdoms of this world. Well, Nebuchadnezzar realizes this is indeed the dream. This must be the interpretation, but. He's interpreting it out of his pagan worldview. I'm the head of gold. Well, I always knew that. <laughs> now, God has, <laughs> now God has confirmed it. Things apparently are going to decline after this. And you can think of um, Hesiod's works and days as uh, world culture defines from gold to silver to brass to iron. Um, but Nebuchadnezzar is, is, is hyper about this and promotes Daniel and his friends. But he doesn't get it, and the next chapter proves that. But for uh, long-range purposes, we are told, in so many words, that there are four kingdoms, empires, that remain till the coming of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom the God of heaven will set up. The kingdom of the God of heaven could be called the kingdom of God of the kingdom of heaven, and the New Testament calls it both. Babylon's identified. We're not told the names of the others at this point, but as we go further into Daniel's prophecy, the next two kingdoms are named. In fact, Daniel lives to see the next kingdom, Medo-Persia. 
After that, he is told in a couple of prophecies that a great king is going to arise out of Greece and come and subdue the Persian Empire. And then, then there's another kingdom after that that it remains unnamed. It's different from all other kingdoms. It's obviously brutal. It stomps on things. It's very powerful. It's not glorious and glamorous, but it's stronger than the other nations. Um, and in the days of that kingdom, Messiah will appear. The kingdom, the God of heaven will set up, will come, and it will replace it, and it will fill the earth. But the, there's an idea here of gradual growth, not of suddenly, oh, here it is, and everything changes. On the other hand, it does replace those kingdoms. It does have political and cultural ramifications. But by its nature, it is a different sort of kingdom. The other kingdoms are human kingdoms. They're, they come together in the shape of a man. They're all extensions, each after the other, of the same humanity, which God will use for a time, and then in, in turn, discipline, destroy, remove in favor of the next kingdom, because his goal is to preserve his people and his promise and his worship for the coming of Messiah. And as long as these kingdoms faithfully perform the, the job of cherub guardians, God works with them. When they turn on his people, God gets rid of them. Babylon's the first. Uh, and when we say head of gold, we think, well, it must have been the greatest kingdom ever. People are often surprised when they actually turn to a Bible map in the back of the Bibles and see the extent of Babylon. <laughs> it's smaller than Medo-Persia, which was smaller than Greece, which was a lot smaller than the Roman Empire. <laughs> and you have to stop and think, wait, why, why, why gold? Well, God doesn't value what we value, does he? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're going to follow the history of this King Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to see his conversion, and we're going to see that he gets to write scripture. This is a Gentile writing scripture in the Old Testament. We won't get much of that again until uh, Dr. Luke writes his gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an incredible privilege, and uh, this, this man becomes, as it were, a type of Messiah in caring for God's people, protecting them, even though all they can see is he's the one who destroyed our city and our temple, because that eventually does happen. They keep rebelling against him, and finally, <laughs> that ends that. But it ended that when Daniel was his right hand man. So Daniel would not have been very popular. Oh, yeah, we didn't what you want? Our, yeah, he's a sellout. He's a, a Benedict Arnold. He's a Quisling. He's a you know, pick your favorite historical figure. Uh. But what he would have been doing would be telling Nebuchadnezzar, here's what God says has to happen. The temple has to go. But God's people, you need to take care of them. And there's this one guy you're going to find in, in Jerusalem. His name's Jeremiah. <laughs> Make sure you guys take care of him, please. All right, Jeremiah. You got that? Okay, Jeremiah. All right, right, we'll look for him. Yeah, take really good care. Oh, well, 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 yeah, well, we'll make sure he's okay. <laughs> and I don't want to read too much into this, but I do love that Babylon is remembered you know, the head of gold, the best yeah. that human empire has to offer. And we remember it for its gardens. I yes. just think that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Which, Which those uh, are very fun to look up and they keep trying to guess because they don't actually have any remnants of them. But no, I've even, I've, I've heard all kinds of variations on the theme of late. The ancient historians said that, and this is a good place to do this, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had ma had married a Median wife who was from the hill country, and she, in this big metropolis, missed her homeland with its gardens and trees and waters and such. And so he set out to build that for her, thus the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which became one of the great wonders of the world. How we sweet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My wife Girls. misses her homeland. Let's yeah. build her a garden. <laughs> Girls, marry some guy like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, at the same time, he also refurbished whatever was left of the Tower of Babel. There probably wasn't a whole lot left at this point. It's been a long, 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 long time. But he began to raise another ziggurat, um, which archaeologists would find at the beginning of the, or the end of the 19th or beginning of the 20th century. I forget the dates. Um, but he he records that, that Babylon, the, 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 the city he created, that's what it was all about. That's what was important to him. Yes, he conquered a good part of the world that he knew. And yet he was most proud and pleased with this incredible city he had built. Here's a 
um, a quote from Herodotus. Babylon lies in a wide plain, a vast city in the form of a square, with sides nearly 14 miles long and a circuit of some 56 miles. And in addition to its enormous side, it surpasses in splendor any city of the known world. It's surrounded by a broad, deep moat full of water, and within the moat there is a wall 50 cubits wide and 200 high. Or how cubit is three inches uh, longer than the ordinary one. <laughs> On top of the wall, they construct along each ed edge a row of one-room buildings facing inward with enough space for a four-horse chariot to pass. Hmm. There are hundreds of gates in the circuit of the wall, all of bronze with bronze uprights and lintels. Here's Josephus um, quoting from a, a Chaldean historian. And then he ordained the temple of Belus, the chief of the gods, and the rest of the temples in a magnificent manner with the spoils he had taken in war. He also added another city to that which was uh, there of old and rebuilt it such that such would um, that such as would besiege it hereafter might no more turn the course of the river and thereby attack the city itself. He therefore built three walls round about the inner city and three other about that which was the outer, and he did this with burnt brick. And after he had, after becoming man, walled the city, he adorned its gates gloriously. He built another palace before this, his father's palace, but so that they joined it to, to describe the vast height and immense riches of which it would perhaps be too much uh, to attempt. Yet, as large and lofty as they were, they were completed in 15 days. Okay, that's probably an exaggeration. He also erected <laughs> elevated... I don't know, if you can't get it done in two weeks, <laughs> what are you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> he erected elevated places for walking of stone and made it resemble a mountain and built it so that it might be planted with all sorts of trees. He also erected what was called a pensive paradise. Pensive. Hanging. Hanging. Paradise. <laughs> garden. Because his wife was desirous to have things like her own country, she having been bred in the palaces of media. So this. Now, before we return to this, um, there is the story, the history of the three young friends who refused to bow. Nebuchadnezzar gets obsessed with this idea that I'm the head of gold, and he raises a gold image and wants everyone to bow. And um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Mishael, Azariah, and... Um, the other one. <laughs> Just lost his name. Is it not Hananiah? Hananiah. Uh, thank you. Um, they refuse to bow. And of course, they have political enemies by now because these young Jews are w growing in power and esteem. The, the enemies point them out. Nebuchadnezzar gives them a chance, second chance. They refuse. They get thrown in the fiery furnace. And Jesus rescues them. And he calls them out. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar calls them out. And... He's getting more serious, but not serious enough yet. He realizes this God of theirs is a force to be reckoned with and that, okay, I thought I was doing what he wanted. I wasn't apparently, and I guess that's okay. He can do what he wants. Um, I'll try to get it right next time. And he has another dream. This is a dream of a great tree, a tree of life, a world axis that gets chopped down. And again, he realizes this is... There's something really big going on here. And he calls the wise men again, but not Daniel, probably because he's got a sneaking suspicion what this one means. They, this time, the wise men don't even try the bluff. We don't know what this is, boss. You know, we, we, we got a clue on this one. Daniel comes in and says, uh, okay, that would be, the tree would be you chopping down. You're about to lose your position, power, and even your reason. Uh, you're going to have the heart of a beast until God's done with you, so that you can learn the most high rules in the kingdoms of men and gives them to him, so over he will. My advice to you is humble yourself and conform your political office to the standards of God's word. This is huge. Here is a Hebrew prophet telling a pagan king that not only your private duties, but your public political and judicial duties need to be conformed to the law of God. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't go very far with that, apparently, because one day he walks out on his balcony and says, is not this great Babylon that I have built, or the glory of my house, and all of that. And God says, well, that's it, we're done here, and he loses his reason, takes on the mind of a, of a cow. 
Oanthropy, it's called. Kind of like leucanthropy, only instead of being <laughs> a werewolf. He's a were cow. <laughs> <laughs> he's a were cow. Um, until at some point, God grants him regeneration and he lifts his eyes to heaven. And I would like to read what he says. And I bless the Most High, and I praise and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto them, What doest thou? His reason returns, and now in a public proclamation to the entire kingdom, which as was a pluralistic culture that worshipped all sorts of gods, he writes this. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he's able to obey. Imagine American president making a formal edict along those lines. We have it in the 200 some odd years of our existence. So Nebuchadnezzar raises the kingdom to the heights of its power, masterful architect, author of scripture, godly man we can hope to see in heaven one day, friend to Daniel, but he dies. And the kingdom passes through a succession of weak hands upon his death until it comes to his uh, son-in-law, a man named Nabonidus. Uh, and Nabonidus has a quarrel with a local priesthood in Babylon and goes into the wilderness and builds a new commercial center in, in the wilderness and leaves his son, Belshazzar in charge of Babylon. And that would be a good place to stop and to make the transition. We'll probably need to spend at least um, a podcast talking about the fall of Babylon, the coming of Cyrus, Cyrus's own background, and Daniel and the lion's den. So let's, let's work on getting ready for that one for next That'll time. That'll be next week. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, let us have some recommendations, shall we? I have something different that um, is very not politically correct anymore in our time period, but it was five years ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's a commentary yeah, times right Times change there. very quickly these days. <laughs> it's true. So um, I would say one of my favorite modern novels um, is called um, The Help. Um, mm -hmm. And when it first came out, it was wildly popular sold millions of copies. Um, but because of the whole woke critical race theory, it was canceled, um, because a white lady helps, mm -hmm. um, to black ladies to basically rise above their position in Jackson in the 1960s. Um, but it is, I enjoy it because I absolutely love the characters and the two black ladies are I like them more than the white lady, <laughs> but they, they, um, represent two very different approaches to service and the civil rights movement. But I thought of it partly cause I've been reading it again recently, but also cause it's another example where they don't, um, try to fight the oppression and such that comes to them by taking arms and harming people. Instead, they write a book and tell their stories and, mm -hmm. um, Oh, it actually changes a lot of people just by giving by giving those alternative narratives. And yet they're also considered revolutionary because they shouldn't ever tell about what their white ladies do. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, I find the characters very endearing and I, th I think it's well written overall. So if you want to read something that used to be considered one of the one of the popular books. Um, it's actually the most fun reading it or listening to it as an audiobook because you get different narrators for the three the three ladies who each narrate different parts. Mm. Um, so and yeah, so there's my uh, Catherine Stockett is the author of it. Very cool. Well, I will also re recommend a reread. Um, I am rereading The Lord of the Rings. Mm. Um, and something that's striking me this time, you know, as we start out with Mr. Frodo in Hobbiton, um, and and the, his his Hobbit friends Pippin and Fatty Bulger and Sam <laughs> and Mary, of course. Um, but what strikes me about Hobbit culture is, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien sat down and wrote these poems 
He's like, I want to write a song about taking a bath. I want to write a poem about walking and trees and, you know, walking out to get the mail. There should be songs about that. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about the entire narrative of The Lord of the Rings. Nobody wants to live through the War of the Rings, right? <laughs> the, the, the ideal that's held up, the whole reason that the war is worth fighting, the whole reason it's worth enduring the struggles and the suffering is so that people can go and get the mail and write songs about it <laughs> and uh, live in a world where people sing. Yeah. There's a line, I don't remember which book it's in or where exactly it occurs in the narrative, but where I, I, I think it's uh, maybe Aragorn describing the um, the owner of the prancing pony. Mm. Butterbur. Says, Butterbur. If, if only he knew those those rangers he disdains. If he only knew that they're there living the life they do so that the people in the Shire can have their tea and go get the mail and sing their songs, and they're willing to sacrifice their comfort, their happiness, even their lives, just so these people can enjoy the blessings of freedom. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a, a very Nebuchadnezzar thing too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, we should have a city where there are gardens. That would be yeah. nice. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, well, I don't have anything profound, but um, as you know, we all know a number of young ladies right now who are with child. <laughs> and so whenever that happens in our house, discussion comes up of what books are we going to get the, the new mama? <laughs> because that is obviously the most important gift you can give a young child or give his mother and father. Books but they have to be keyed just properly. Now, there's there's a lot of books that our family has enjoyed and we read to our kids. The first book, the first thing I ever bought for my daughter before she was born was a copy of Make Way for Ducklings, mm. which is a lovely story, but that's not what I'm going to recommend. That's, that's actually a little classier than what I'm going to recommend. I'm going to recommend <laughs> Sandra Boynton's, but not the hippopotamus. Oh, yay. Yay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little board book. And as, as you flip through it, it's, it's a little silly and it, the cartoons are sweet and such. And it takes you a while, if you're not looking carefully, to realize that all of these animals are on Noah's Ark. <laughs> we're mm. never told that. You just have to watch the background and figure out what's going on. Oh, so, I think maybe you're thinking of the uh, going to bed book. Sorry, no. I'm a Sandra Boynton aficionado now, so I can tell you. <laughs> no, <laughs> the it's going not, to it, bed book is on the, on the Noah's Ark. Are the hippopotamus also? Yeah. No? Pretty sure. I'll have to reread well, it. Well, we'll have to look and see. <laughs> anyway, Controversy the, go on the, going, the Going to Bed book is also wonderful. So there we go. That wraps it up for this week. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I can't let that go by without saying that Sandra Boynton is an unmitigated comedic genius. <laughs> um, and you should also look her up on Spotify. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see you next week with further discussions of heady <laughs> theological and historical topics like <laughs> Babylon and the destruction of Belshazzar and all that. But thank you so much for this conversation, both of you. It's been a delight, as always. Uh, big thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully weighted husband. Uh, thanks to our transcriptionist. If you'd like to receive the transcripts of the show in your email inbox, you can head over to our Substack and sign up there. Um, if you would like to send us an email, you can do that with our email address, which is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Um, and if you would like to support us financially, we greatly appreciate it. We give a big, gigantic thank you to our financial supporters who keep the show rolling and pay for nice editing software that we could not do without. Um, you can visit our Patreon. That's uh, patreon.com slash haltingtowardszion. Thanks so much for listening. Tell a friend us tell a friend about us if you think they would enjoy this stuff. We do. So <laughs> hope you do too. Join us next time. <laughs> Bye.